nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris, et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Brethren in Christ, viva Cristo Rey. Viva Cristo Rey. I'm here today with Luis Medina. Luis, how you doing, brother? Good. Thanks a lot, uh, Timothy. I'm very excited to be here once again. Thanks for the invite. Uh, I guess I made it to the second round. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, uh, very happy to have you on ag again, brother. Uh, my name is Timothy Flanders, and this is the meaning of Catholic. Today, our show is called Catholic Empire, the true story of Spain and the faith. Now, we had our first show with Luis on the Black Legends of Spain, which mostly covered before 1500. And this show is going to start around 1500 and go forward. And we'll talk about the subject a little bit more. But the important reason why we're doing it today is today is the eve of the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is the heart of Spain in this period and beyond. So, uh, Luis, what do you do for the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe? Traditionally, uh, we go to Mass. Obviously, given some of the challenges that we're facing all of us across the nation and the world, um, we're going to figure out. I'm blessed enough to be in the Diocese of Fort Worth uh, that I can go to Mass. It's going to be a Mass, so that's what I'm going to do as a good Catholic. Uh, but a little side note, I just thought of it. Um, in Mexico City, the Basilica apparently is going to be close. Uh, oh. tomorrow go figure but anyway Shame. so uh yeah i'm gonna go to mass obviously rosaries our prayers and uh just uh have a good time we're still in advent so you know we'll try to keep up oh yeah we usually have mexican food of some kind on our lady of guadalupe oh, so i have so much food right now from thanksgiving and all that for us and that <laughs> it's just i'm tempted but i can't do any mexican food right now oh yeah okay well uh the we did our first show covered the black legends. Now mm -hmm. the, what we're, what we're going to start with today is addressing kind of the overall misconception by many English speakers, English thinkers, English, English historians, that when we think about the Catholic world, the Catholic civilization, we need to go all the way back to the middle ages. Mm -hmm. I don't like that term. I think it's a pejorative term, but yeah. you know, the 1200s, basically the glorious 13th century of St. Thomas Aquinas, etc. And there's a sense that after 1500, it just goes straight downhill from there. But what we're going to talk about with Spain is that there is sort of a, um, Spain continues the Catholic civilization. Uh, it, it seems to me, uh, Luis, tell me what you think about this, because the second half of the second millennium, so 1500 at present, Mm -hmm. Seems to be Spain is dominant really for about 250 years or so, 1750 more or less. And then after that, that's when the Frank, the, the French, the English and the American empires start to be dominant in the world. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Sort of. Yeah, uh, that's pretty, pretty accurate. Let's go with it. Yeah. OK, so the the enemies of Spain and that's both England and America as, as well as France have been waging, and we'll talk about also the Dutch, who meld with the English later, uh, they've been waging a constant propaganda war against Spain. Yeah. And we talked about that in our first show. We talked about the black legends of the Spanish Inquisition, the uh, expulsion of the Jews and Muslims, mm -hmm. the conquistadores and their atrocities, and how that was used as propaganda by first the Herod for the, the Protestants for a while. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about there's also the Whig history and the, the Anglo history and the Marxist history and everything, all these other historical frameworks that basically say, well, the, the world is constantly progressing as Spain is in in this, this backwoods Christendom, <laughs> medieval Spanish Inquisition, whatever, and they're just behind the times. And that whole historical mindset has sought to denigrate Spain as sort of this backwards civilization. Yeah. So it seems to be that this, what we're trying to do with this is correct a great deal of history 
so that people can Catholics can take great pride in the in the the greatness of of God's grace to Spain and through Spain to the world. And on that note, Louise, what would you say? How much of the world today is Catholic because of Spain? Um, basically, I will say like a big chunk of it right now is the remnant is the Catholic uh, strains that they're still right now untouched per se, to put it that way. It is the only civilization that actually literally evangelized half of the world. Um, not, I'm not hyperbolizing that term. I mean, it is reality. Um, but let's uh, let me address something very quickly. You mentioned about the Black Legend. Obviously, we covered that in last show. Uh, quick note, often just a quick refresher. It is often viewed that Spain pertains only to Spanish speaking. And actually, that's not necessarily true. You could be Italian. You could be uh, Dutch. You could be um even indigenous and all that and that's still you had the same worth as, uh, as a spanish citizen you know aragonese all those things so in other words is to be spaniard that necessarily means you were speaking castilian all right so um it's not in other words it's not an exclusively hispanic phenomenon it went beyond the iberian peninsula which is where spain and portugal are located and it reached a whole world, literally. I mean, it was half of the world. It was the empire, the original empire where the sun never set. That being said, um, quick recap as well in history, the story of Spain starts with Our Lady. And that's why I'm very pleased to be with you in this channel on the eve of Our Lady of Guadalupe. You know, that's a, uh, there's a, I can hardly think of any more Marian land than Spain, maybe France, I don't know. Um, because our Spain starts with Our Lady in Zaragoza. We cover that very quickly. You know, the, it's not an apparition. It's what, a bilocation. I don't know how to transportation. She was still alive, you know, um, and appears to uh, St. James, uh, the apostle. And from there on, it's, you know, all history, like, you know, Muslims invade eventually. Well, the kingdom becomes, you know, after the Toledo Council, it comes Spain and Muslims come to the picture. And then the reunification of those kingdoms, what becomes eventually Spain. And that's when we part right now. When now reunited after conquering or reconquering Granada, southern Spain, now they go off to the world. 1492. That's when the history for us here in the new world, that includes you, by the way, uh, starts really. Um, to put a little context was, by the time Columbus sailed to the New World, the Spanish crown was broke because they had to fight wars against the Moors. Wars, I don't know if you checked last time, they were pretty expensive. So, you know, they were dealing with the Moors, but even after that, they say, we got to go and see what's going on. So Columbus comes back, brings report of these new people and all that, and, and they realize, wait a minute, they're not enemies of the faith. They're not like Moors. They're not Jews. They're not what are they? That was a real question. And this is where that uh, so-called medieval, you know, to use that term that you were bringing at the beginning, that Thomistic thought reemerges thanks to Spain and thanks specifically to the Salamanca school, to be more, uh, uh, you know, particular, if, you, if I may. It is Salamanca that really guides the kings of Spain saying, this is what we ought to do with this new people. This is what is in line with Catholicism. This is what is in line with St. Thomas Aquinas. This is what is in line with the faith. This is what Mary is expecting of us and all these other values. And this is why, this is how we ought to conduct ourselves as, uh, as a kingdom from now on. So this is where we're going to part, Timothy. Absolutely. Just so the... On the subject of uh, the actual distance, here is a map of Philip II. We're going to talk about Philip II today. Mm -hmm. This is the at at Philip II's reign. Everything that's colored here is some sort of Spanish uh, dominion possession, vice, Spanish dominion. We're going to talk about the distinction between a colony and a vice royalty as well. Mm -hmm. So everything that's colored here is part of the Spanish dominion. So we have all of the Iberian Peninsula and parts of Italy, uh, the Netherlands area, parts of Germany, modern Germany. We have the Canary Islands around Africa. We have all these settlements around Africa. We have North and South America. And then we go all the way over here. We've got India and we have the Philippines. Yeah. So we have all these are, these are just the initial settlements where missionaries were sent and evangelizing the peoples. So this show, what we will do is 
we're going to try to just use this as a basis to expand later in the future. Um, so we're going to talk about monarchs, the monarch, the first big three um, of the Habsburg dynasty. And we'll talk more about Salamanca. Also, Cortez and Montezuma, as well as the first Republican revolution, which happens in the Netherlands against Spain. So where does this all start? in terms of the monarchs, Luis. We talked about the Ferdinand and Isabella. Tell us about them and why are they considered to be the sort of the first Spanish monarchs in, in terms of this new period? Well, there is so, every monarch is relevant, but Ferdinand and Isabella or Elizabeth, or Elizabeth, uh, Queen Isabella and Ferdinand of Aragon, they're two kingdoms that are united. One of them from Castile, which is the heart of a Hispanic culture anyway, till this day. Uh, Castile and Leon, you know, which is more like towards the middle. Aragon is towards like the coast where, you know, Barcelona and Valencia and all that area, like towards Italy. So they unite and they become the Catholic kingdom, you know, and Isabella is the one I personally, and a lot of people agree with me, like people like Dr. Barcena, uh, Guillermo Perez Galicia, Daniel, all these scholars, great scholars, bright minds agree that Isabella probably is the best queen monarch we have ever seen like the greatest example of a catholic monarch as a matter of fact ferdinand was very catholic as well too ferdinand i'm not gonna lie but isabella had a very deep devotion she was definitely somebody who was committed to the catholic faith uh and wanted to make sure that her kingdom reflected that so when they get married and that becomes again the unity of those two kingdoms Spain, in other words, is back in business. You know, what the Moors tore apart, now they're bringing back and they come in with a lot of strength. So that's where we part. And as they uh, discover these new lands and decisions have to be made, just like I mentioned earlier, it was Queen Isabella's strong will, to be honest, that determined this is how we're going to deal with this new people. We're going to catechize them and we're going to give them rights. Obviously, she didn't bring that out of nowhere. She had to consult with uh, the scholars at the time, mostly recited at Salamanca. There was a particular guy. Um, there's many, honestly, but in my opinion, a particular guy who played a big role in the shaping of Thought of Salamanca, Francisco de Vitoria. Um, he was the one, in my opinion, who re influenced Salamanca, in other words, like took that Thomistic values. And he's kind of like the proto human rights guy. Put it that way, all right? Like before human rights were a thing, even uh, is uh, Vittoria the one who really put that Thomistic thought? And, and let me make a quick distinction. By the way, I'm not a philosopher. You won't want to talk to a philosopher about this, but like to put it in layman terms, um, the uh, Thomistic or scholastic thought in the early so called medieval age or, you know, uh, that glorious century was dealing more with like. Uh, philosophical questions, more abstract things, which were very valuable. The second scholasticism way was dealing more with practical applications. And it makes sense because you have now new responsibilities. There's a new world. There's this new thing that you've never dealt with before. So that's why Salamanca became so distinct. And it lasted quite a while, as a matter of fact. You want to know what brought it down? The Enlightenment, or so-called Enlightenment. Um, so here we have this huge enterprise, and now they have to figure out what are we going to do with these people? Well, they, they realize they have rights, they have God's image, imago Dei, in other words, and they we ought to give them uh, the faith. But it came with some uh, uh, restraints with a seal, to put it that way, is... We cannot force convert them. I know a black legend says otherwise. You've seen all these pamphlets probably, and you know they tell you all this bad history. It's not true, actually. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a document that the University of Valencia published. You can find it in some PDF file right now. Uh, it's for free. And uh, if you go there, you, you can see all these like uh, documents that were written from Salamanca delineating how we ought to uh, treat the uh, indigenous people which they call them the Indias, by the way, not Americas uh, in Spain. So when they were uh, granting these things questions, like for example, property, that was addressed back then. Does this guy have a right of property? Yes. Uh, what about faith? Well, um, as long as we're not forbidden from preaching the gospel, 
Um, how much things have, uh, how, how much things have changed lately, huh? But as long as from the Spanish perspective, it's as long as we are not forbidden from preaching the gospel, um, they can do whatever they want. As long as they don't violate us, they don't hurt us, or whatever it is. And if they get baptized, we ought to receive them into the faith. That's a completely different narrative than what you hear through uh, misinformation, you know, the original fake news, in other words. Um, and like that, so many other questions. And all of that, all of that happened because of, you know, uh, these two kings that were financing this uh, university uh, and they were really bringing scholars and they were really trying to make shape of the new world in a Catholic way. Yeah. So we've got Queen Isabella in particular, who is creating this Catholic empire of the map that we see here. And she is being guided and funding the, Salam the school of Salamanca, which is guiding the with Catholic principles. Now, can you describe the difference between a colonization and a vice royalty? Absolutely. And, and how is that different? I'm wondering if, uh, I know that we can talk about how England and the Dutch colonies contrast that, but does it also hold for Portugal? Do they also have a contrasting vision? So talk um, about distinction. Yeah, absolutely. So the first of all, the main distinction is a colony is, let's say, like a subject to uh, another entity. In this case, the crown. They have no rights, at least not equal rights to the mainland or the main crown. A vice royalty literally is an extension of that kingdom. So in other words, is you were just a Spanish, and that's how they people identify themselves all the way to the Philippines, by the way, or even Taiwan, because they reach all the way that far. Uh, you were identified as a Spanish citizen um, the, rather than a subject. And there's two the key distinct uh, differences, because when the Indians, at least from the American perspective, file grievances, they could appeal to the Spanish court all the way back in the mainland. And that's kind of a big deal. Never in the story of like any history of humanity, of empires, I don't care what empire you pick, never has ever happened this thing when the conquerors make the conquer their equals, their peers. That's thanks to the school of Salamanca. In other words, is okay, we won. Clearly we won. But now you are my brother and you have the same rights as I do in front of the king and the church. You have the same access to it. And they did, by the way. You know, a lot of Indians ended up in as nobility in Spain. As a matter of fact, one of the descendants of Montezuma, believe it or not, still lives in Spain and is a royalty. So I actually is a member of royal family. So that was the main difference. The vice royalty literally is an extension. In other words, it was all one, to put it in modern terms, one same passport. You know, there's not such thing as uh, territorial ownership. That's the thing. Now, the distinction between uh, different uh, countries or states, how they did it, the northern countries that, that tend to go Protestant obviously became more interested in expanding their uh, um, gains, per se, and not so much interested in evangelizing. Now, that's a different topic or a different occasion, just but we got to clarify that. Portugal did not do it to the extent of the Spanish, but it was closer to the Spanish style than the uh, Dutch or the uh, English, uh, or even the French, per se, um, how they're approaching these things. The, the real question here is a lot of people wonder, well, why? Why would the Spanish do it differently than, let's say, the, the Northern French or um, the Dutch or the English? Um, I consulted this with a, lot of, with a lot of scholars, and they agree that probably that Roman thought, you know, because we're descendants of the Romans, the Romans language, um, had a lot to do. Uh, and the way they perceive things, you know, so they want to order things to be Roman is to be order, in other words. Uh, so they saw themselves as, okay, we're extending our order to the rest of the confines of the earth. Um, it could be many other reasons, but that kind of makes sense to me a lot more. Um, and ever since, by the way, we have won wars, other empires, other countries have won wars. And is we win, you lose. Uh, now, excuse me, let me take your land and uh, you, you you know, can't do anything about it. Only Spain actually did like, okay, you, we won, but now you're part of me. Think of it in the modern, not, not to uh, diverge a little bit, but like in modern terms, I don't know if you're familiar with the fallen, uh, Valley of the Fallen Soldiers in Spain. There's this big, big monument in Spain. Anyway, uh, Franco built it. 
And he, after the civil war in Spain, he actually buried both heroes from both sides, not just from, you know, from the phalanx. It was both. And used the cross to be as a symbol of unity. You know, that's in the spirit of Spain. Whether we agree with it or not, that's different about Franco. But the spirit of, like, we are united, even though we were enemies, has only been seen in that case. Hopefully we can bring it back. Yeah, we will be covering Franco eventually in yeah. the 20th century Spain. It's very important. Um, so it starts back here. So the legacy of Ferdinand and Isabella passes mm -hmm. to Charles the First, Carlos the First, aka Charles the Fifth, Holy Roman Emperor. So we're going to cover him and Philip the Second. So yeah. tell us about Charles the First. What is he doing? Charles the First um, comes, it becomes the first emperor, literally crowned uh, emperor by the Pope himself. So in other words, he's at the level of Charlemagne. And that's a key moment for all of us here in the new world, because that's the moment when King uh, Ferdinand and Queen Isabella uh, died, Spain only reached um, the Caribbean and the coast of America, but they haven't really penetrated all the way. So they kind of had a vague idea something might be there maybe not who knows but then comes this guy named hernan cortez the father of the not just like uh, the real father of mexico to be honest um and that's when charles v is emperor so cortez uh sails for the new world in 1504 you know, 1502 he realized you know what i'm gonna go to the new world and i'm gonna make a little parenthesis here if i may Everybody, part of the black legend, treats Cortes as this barbarian, you know, this like crazy European, kind of like a sort of like a Spanish Viking version kind of thing. You know, that's the furthest thing from reality. I mean, he spoke Latin. He studied in Salamanca. I mean, he was a very smart, you know, he was a notary, which in here in America, apparently I learned this. One of the cultural lessons being a notary is not necessarily like, like a big deal. Uh, in Mexico, it is. I mean, it, not everybody can be a notary. It takes some, you know, work. So anyway, uh, so Cortez was a notary and all those things. So he's, he, in 1502, he realized, you know what? I'm going to go try luck in the new world. That's the same year that Montezuma, by the way, uh, becomes the emperor of the Aztec Empire. So then he sails for the new world in 1504. Charles V uh, comes to power. And then he's stuck in Cuba. He makes money and all that. And he just reports about this land, this mythical land, this mythical land. And Charles V has to deal with, you know, quelling rebellions at home and dealing with now this new kingdom and inheriting these things and all these just, you know, political things going on at home. Plus, the you know, eventually the Lutheran rebellion will happen. And Cortes sails in uh, 15, uh, 09, 1519, pardon, I'm sorry, to uh, Mexico through Yucatan and explores. And we heard those stories about the, the burning of the ships and all that. That's when it happens. So he takes 11 ships from his own money and then sells to Mexico and realize there's something here once he lands and it goes all the way down and then realize, all right, game on, you know? Uh, so he burns 10 ships, keep one, sends that one ship to the motherland, to Charles V or Charles I to be more specific. And Charles I grants him uh, legality because he was kind of a rogue type of conqueror. Once that was said, Charles V essentially becomes what he was. It was thanks to uh, Cortes, you know, was, uh, because Cortes brings all this source of income. Cortes brings all these cultures. That's when this Hispanic culture really translates to the new world. It was thanks to Cortes. And it was Charles I who was the guy who was financing this whole thing. Well, we know part of the history of the conquest of Mexico, Cortes leads it, 1521, Mexico or Tenochtitlan, like what is, uh, which by the way, speaking of black legends and fake news, there was not such thing as Mexico, by the way, back then. You know, uh, history tells us that we Mexicans were Aztecs or whatever, that's not true. Uh, there was this empire, speaking of empires, that had all these Indian tribes subjugated and everybody hated the Aztecs. I mean, I know that's maybe not politically correct, but that's a fact. Everybody hated the Aztecs. Why? Because the Aztecs were oppressing them really bad. And on top of that, the Aztecs did a lot of human sacrifices. Uh, I don't know if you notice on the weaponry of the Aztecs, they have obsidian stones and all these bats and clubs, per se. Um, and there was a purpose for that. Because 
they were not interested in killing their adversaries on the spot. They want to maim them. You know, they want to hurt them so they can keep them alive and bring them to the pyramids for sacrifices, right? So there's the so when Cortez lands, they have this huge chunk of people that were so mad at the Aztecs and they were they couldn't wait for to be liberated. So here comes Cortez at the right place at the right time, with about six hundred soldiers essentially, which is not a whole lot. And defeats an empire of like almost half a million people. Let me put it in perspective very quickly. Um, Alexander the Great conquered the Persians. He went with 40,000 soldiers and conquered the Persians. Cortes had 600 Spaniards against this huge empire. So, you know, he goes and sends all these riches to the new world, uh, to the old world, I'm sorry, with Charles the uh, first. Charles the first now has to deal eventually, as we know, with the Protestant revolt. Um, as Cortes discovers new worlds, the German territory is starting to rebel, and no. that's where. How how many how many Indian allies? You said that pretty much everyone revolted with Cortes. There were about 80,000 80, plus uh, Indian allies uh, who enabled the conquering of uh, Tenochtitlan. So what was the key difference is the Aztecs were not bad warriors. It's just that the Spanish had superior tactics. Why would they have superior tactics? Well, first of all, they had weaponry, uh, which you know they managed in forged steel. Um, that's just a historical thing from Europeans. But the second thing is the Spanish were pretty callous battle tried and tested because they had to deal with 700 years of Muslim occupation. So they were used to going against all odds. I mean, Covadonga, we all know that battle and all those things. So, so for, in the Spanish um, spirit, they already is basically like if we put it on, on, on sports terms for those of you who love sports, it's like starting the game already with, you know, a couple of touchdowns against you, you know, like, so that's kind of like the mindset they come with, like, okay, it's not fair. And it's the, the playing level feels not, you know, equal and all those things, but I still got to win somehow. Well, so Cortez comes with that Spanish logistical spirit and defeats with the help of the Indians, because really it was more the Indians, uh, the Aztec empire. And that's the beginning of real new Spain and the Spanish empire. So he really becomes the leader of this Indian rebellion, mm -hmm. is essentially what it is, and, yeah. which is simply reclaiming what they already had because these Indians had been conquered by the Aztecs. Yeah, and that's it, big, um, big truth for the black legend of the oh yeah conquistadors. And one of the things a lot of people forget about the the rituals. Let's let's look at a more balanced way because often we hear. There's such thing called the Rose Legend, which is the opposite of the Black Legend. In other words, is everything that Spain did was perfect and awesome, and it was basically angels from heaven. Well, that's not true. You know, we're, we live in a fallen world. But then you have obviously the Black Legend, you know, the, which is the worst attributes you can think of uh, were Spanish. Well, that's not true. Um, let's analyze it from the Indian perspective very quickly. The Aztecs were excellent warriors, but on their cosmology, um, they understood. I'm not making an apology for I'm just explaining what it is, uh, that they had to make human sacrifices in order, in order to ensure the dawn of a new day. And that was their theology. They also had an understanding in a distorted way, evidently, of communion. So, for example, they will... Um, uh, skin their victims and they will wear their skin and they will that will be sort of an act of communion with a foe you know um to us obviously and it's still horrifying and were, it was horrifying to the spaniards but like part of the evangelization like the gospel and the conversion for the indians made a lot of sense because in their distorted view they already had an understanding of communion and understanding of uh sacrifices and all these things it was just obviously geared towards evil rather than than god so here comes spain cortez ceases all sacrifices then the days kept going and there's a new day and a new day and a new day and years go by and the indians besides getting sick they start getting depressed because they basically realize what have we done and not just that so it was all a lie in other words it's like what when it, it 
uh, obviously taking somebody's life is a very traumatic event, I assume. Uh, I hope I never had that experience. And so these guys have done it like 24 seven almost, you know, and they realize, wait a minute, what happened here? And they started dying of depression. They didn't want to marry. It was Queen Isabella originally before she died that in her testament, her will, she encouraged Spanish citizens to intermarry. And I explained a little bit of that in, in, in our previous video, video with the indigenous people. The Indians did not want to intermarry with the Europeans. And mind you, there were Europeans coming from all sorts of you know walks of life, from the Netherlands, from Italy, from you know the mainland and all that. And they were just getting depressed and dying. And they basically have blood on their hands and they don't know what to do. The one thing that stopped that was our leader Guadalupe, by the way. You know, but you know, we can address that in a little bit. But anyway, so um in, among those things, Charles the First had to deal. Now he was an emperor. He had to deal with the new world. What are we going to do? How are we going to finance? And how are we going to convert him? And also the Protestant revolt, you know, in, in the northern European territories. That took a lot of effort. You know, um, honestly, I don't envy his his place in history. Yeah, I was just looking up the dates here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 1517 is when the uh, Protestant revolt starts going. Martin Luther happens. Hernan yeah. Cortez conquests the Aztecs with Indian help at 1519, 1521. Yeah. Then we have Our Lady Guadalupe, 1531. Yeah. And then we have, I was just looking, the Jesuits happen in 1540. Another Spanish uh, great effort here the uh other conquistadores so charles v is during this time now we've got charles v we've got philip ii mm -hmm. his son what 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 happens next here um what happens next is very uh interesting so obviously the Al augsburg uh peace first in europe uh where the treaty was essentially we're going to let, for those who don't know, we're going to let the Protestants remain Protestants. Lutheran, to be more specific, because uh, it was not just any Protestant. It was actually specifically Luther Lutheran. So you're going to be remain Lutheran if that's what dominates the prince in your region. You're going to be Catholic if you're on the Catholic side. Uh, anybody else, tough luck. Well, that obviously did not work and eventually fed uh, into the 80 years war, which we'll talk about it later. Uh, kind of like World War One fed into World War Two, you know, the same way. Like the Peace of Augsburg did not really work. Charles V, it's extremely tired and disappointed that he could not have this Christian global empire and abdicates. And then Philip II ascends uh, the throne. The, the throne, I'm sorry. Uh, very quickly, when you mentioned 1517, Francisco Hernandez de Cordova was the first Spanish when he reaches the coast of Yucatan, modern-day Yucatan in Mexico, the same year. So if you look at in parallels, you have some sort of uh, leak up here in Europe, but then you start having some growth here on the other side of the ocean. It's, it's funny how things balance and how our, our Lord kind of in the grand scheme of things is just, you know, you cannot outdo our Lord, I guess. Um so you see all these events happening. And to put it in perspective, by the way, when uh, Philip II goes into uh, you know power or Charles V and all that, uh, during those kingdoms, the Mexico City Cathedral, the one you see on you know, popular news and articles and whatnot, that was late on 1524. That construction started in 1524, just to give them perspective. It was finished in 1534. To get a little bit of a picture of comparison, uh, Jamestown's church here in the you know modern day United States, Virginia, the there was like four different attempts to build it, uh, but really it was the third attempt on uh, Jamestown's church on brick because before it was just you know wood and kind of like almost not very sturdy uh, buildings that burn all the time, but the really first brick building of Jamestown's church was on 1639. Just to you know, to get a little perspective of, of time frame, um, way way later. Like you have by 1534 already, a hundred years almost uh, earlier, a full cathedral, not just the church, and it was in uh, modern day Mexico City. Um, so that that gives a little bit of what's going on here, you know, in, in the time frame reference. 
Philip II goes into power, a gray monarch, highly, highly demonized Philip II. You may ask, why? Well, Philip II was the guy who had to deal with the English uh, enmity. It's one of the saddest stories. England, before becoming Protestant, was one of the greatest allies of the Iberian Peninsula. They actually helped the Portuguese uh, defeat some of the Moors. They, uh, when Spain kicked out the Moors from Granada in 1491, the English ran the bells out of joy and celebration. It was a huge celebration of Europe. Finally, we kicked the Moors out of the, you know, the, the mainland Europe and all those things. Well, obviously, the English separation happened and that tainted the relationships, and now they're enemies, as we know the story. Um, and it was during King Philip II that the conflict really began against the uh, English, and obviously the propaganda against Spain and all that really started with Philip II. So he's, he's highly demonized from mainstream media in backday terms, to put it that way. Um but he was a great king, actually. He had more possessions than his dad. He extended that. He went all the way to Asia. He, uh, it was actually unlike his dad. I mean, his dad was devout, but Philip II was actually very devout. He was actually born in Spain, unlike uh, Charles I. He was born in uh, Belgium, modern-day Belgium. Well, Philip II was actually uh, in Spain, and he built this monastery slash royal palace called the Escorial. I don't know if you've seen pictures. It's a beautiful building, beautiful place. Uh, and it was a monastery. You have monarchs uh, buried there. And it's always invested in the faith. It was, I mean, it was so grandiose that even if Spain wanted to do that nowadays, they will not have the funds and the money to build those things, honestly. So Spain is building all these things and plus building universities and schools and monasteries in Mexico and all the way through, uh, you know, South America and all these things, all that out of the money of the monarchy, of the crown. Um, and, and that's something that we forget to mention. You know, in other words, is um, part of this. Um, yeah, that's the escorial, escorial in Spanish. Um, it's an incredible, I mean, it took a while to build, but uh, it, it's an incredible piece of architecture, to be honest. Um, that was, uh, you know, pay for. It was starting in 1563, and it was finished in 1584. Basically, what, 21 years? I don't know. I'm not good at math. Um, an incredible piece. Uh, um, yeah, I've, I've heard uh, <clears throat> one historian mentioned how the big difference between France and Spain was that when you look at their imperial palaces, the, the palace of the king, the, the title of this palace of, of the Spanish king is literally the monastery. Mm -hmm. It's a monastery. Yeah. The monastery is the central part of their palace. Yeah. Um, whereas in Versailles, later on, the, 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 the palace. palace of Versailles, the, there's a little chapel on the side. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like so you can just see with the architecture that the the very heart of the the Spanish crown is the faith. The, the question is why, honestly, I, mean, I like to ask why often is why is it that one you know group of people sees things one way? Maybe because I'm bicultural, you know, having Hispanic and also you know living here in the United States half of my life, um, the way they perceive things. The Spanish view comes from, obviously, as mentioned before, uh, Salamanca's view, but really comes in line with Catholicism. What's the Catholic view? Uh, at the end of the day, what, you know, if you want to ask is, we harmonize as Catholic things. The, the non-Catholics, particularly in the Protestant view, but you know anybody in general, they balance things. So to put in a more concrete example, let's say... You can have a uh, homestead or a farm, and you can do multiple types of, uh, you know, uh, I forgot the name. It's not monoculture. It's the other one. Then you plant different crops. You rotate. You have animals to help you balance things and all this. That's harmony. Or you can have a, a single crop, and you can use all these pesticides, and you can use all these forces trying to control it, that's balancing, you know, and Catholicism is about harmony more than balance. And that was impregnated in the Spanish or Hispanic spirit. Um, and that's how they view things. The French uh, really, and that's maybe for a different show, different time, but the French brought this centralism, you know, the concept of power, whereas the Spanish, even back from Queen Isabella and even before, 
they they view power as more of a harmony. So that's why you could have communities that spoke Aragonese, uh, Basque, um, or Galician, or Portuguese, or you name it, um, different languages, and still be under the same umbrella. And they all were still loyal to the king. Uh, whereas in the French view, or Northern European was more of balancing things and, you know, kind of, we all have to be on the same page. Um, and that has cultural ramifications, by the way. Yeah, it seems to be that there is, with the French monarchs, even in this period, because the French are not, uh, the Charles V is is putting his full support between behind the Council of Trent, a yeah. bunch of Spanish bishops are going to the Council of Trent, yeah. whereas the French are, they don't want to be a part of the Council of Trent. They don't even send bishops there. There's a, and then they're at war with Spain. So France is already uh, not doing well in this century. They're not getting with the program against the Protestants. And this becomes a problem in the next century, which we'll get into. But I think what you're talking about with balance and, and uh, harmony is, is such, an, such a great point, because I think with both the French monarchs and the English monarchs, there's an irrigation of greater and greater power to themselves, which causes an imbalance. Mm -hmm. And because it's basically tyranny, and so then they have to fight wars with the, the nobles and whatnot to try to find some kind of balance of power because they're already taking more power from themselves. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's an incredible point, I think, in terms of uh, sort of a philosophical point that redounds out to the, the pol pol uh, politi political uh, system. Can you tell us more about, speaking of philosophy, Salamanca and the achievements of Salamanca during this period. How, how, what can we understand about that? Well, first of all, we understand from Salamanca that the reason why we have uh, brown people is because of Salamanca. You know, so in other words, is that was the difference between extermination and inclusion. It was thanks to those theologians from Salamanca, those friars, these uh, Dominicans, and eventually also Jesuits, as the uh, Society of Jesus was founded. I get it. Jesuits nowadays, a different topic. Uh, a lot of they give us a headache, but we, I'm the guy who's the, we owe a lot to them. So we have to bear with them a lot, often. It's like, um, we would not be here if, you know, if it was not through them. And they've been attacked a lot by the Protestants and the Masons, to be honest, for the longest time. But anyway, um, back to the differences. It was Salamanca's thought that guaranteed the Indians they didn't lose property. The Catholic principle is subsidiary. You know that better than I. In that concept, Salamanca brought it from abstract to actually applicable. And, and it's like, okay, how are we going to apply it to this Indian? How are we going to apply it to his family? So I mentioned that before. Part of the laws they enacted was, all right, you have an encomienda, which was kind of like a, a piece of land uh, that you had to take care of. You had Indian workers. And it's like, yes, you may have that, but they apply like an economic principle. But you can't just do whatever you want. You know, we're not libertarians. Um, you have a responsibility to. I mean, you have a right and privilege, but at the same time, you have ex expectations and responsibilities. Uh, and you're going to have to give an answer to our Lord for the blessings you've given. So uh, since you were in a privileged class, you are indebted to make sure that your workers are taken care of. So it's more like a stewardship, once again, harmony, than actually ownership. Uh, and that permeated through the culture. This also this is why, uh, culturally speaking, in a family concept in the Hispanic you know, uh, context, we tend to see family a little more extended than the Anglo counterparts. Um, usually when they say family here in the United States, it means the nucleus family, mother, father, children. That's it. Whereas down there, it's more like, you know, well, yeah, that's. It's the, we have grandpa, grandma, and aunts and uncles kind of thing, you know, like a little more extended. We stretch it a little further, you know, because we see it as part of the, this whole harmony interaction. Well, that's thanks to the philosophy in Salamanca. Again, it's an applicable thing for real world, real challenges. Um, obviously, the funding of school and universities, it was thanks to that, uh, that thought. And um, as sadly, and that's way later, but as this new ideas, uh, what we call this so-called enlightenment, uh, started hurting not just Spain, but Catholicism in general, well, we all suffered. And here we are. So the Charles V 
and Philip II continue the tradition of funding and being guided by yeah. Salamanca. So they are f- actively funding priests to go to the New World mm-hmm. and pr- protect the Indians from these ex- excesses from greedy men who want to just enslave them and abuse them. Yeah. And evangelize them and catechize them. You mentioned on our last show how the monarchs would actually send the uh, these priests to test yeah. the Indians' catechetical knowledge because it was the responsibility of the landowner yeah. to catechize all the Indians under yeah. his land. Yeah. So they are evangelizing all of these realms that we showed. Let me. So we Philip II. Um, let me share this map one more time. So when we get to Philip II, and he dies, I believe, 1598, if I recall. Mm-hmm. Um, so here we are. We have the Iberian Peninsula, and then Philip II is evangelizing all of these areas on his dime. Yeah. All the way to the Philippines. So they've gotten to the Philippines. We're going to cover some more of the South America and Philippines next time. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us about the... And we're going to get more into the Protestants in just a second. But what's happening with beauty in this time? Art, architecture, music, literature. What's um, happening here? It's a great question, by the way. Um, by the, I'm not an art expert. I'm just clarify that. But that being said, what's happening there? First of all, with the Protestant world, it takes different shapes, as we all know. Uh, you have different from Swingley, which is full blast iconoclasts, and even Calvin, which is halfway, but his followers, as we know, they take it all the way, you know, to home base. Uh, and then you have Luther, who kind of, you know, water it down a little bit. And then uh, it all started with the uh, erosion of the sacraments, obviously, and the breakup with the church. And that takes cultural consequences. So iconoclasts start spreading through Calvinism in the lower countries. Um, you still see remnants of there. They started destroying, destroying cathedrals as Spain is building beautiful churches in Baroque style or even Gothic style, uh, mimicking what's in the homeland. Uh, possessions in the northern Europe part of the world, it, they're being torn apart. And that's what Philip II had to do. Well, also literary works. Uh, we have, by the way, quick, before I forget, uh, on Salamanca, there's three, if you want to investigate more, for those of you who are watching this video, uh, Francisco Vitoria is one of those guys you have to study. Francisco Suarez uh, was another guy that you should uh, check it out. And Fray Luis de Leon, probably, that's a little later, but still uh, great, great uh, influence. He actually was advising the King Philip himself, you know, uh, his theology chair of the University of Salamanca. Um, so anyway, so uh, the English separate 1534, Council of Trent, uh, 1545 to 63. And you have this explosion of art. All these UNESCO sites, world heritage, that you find still in Mexico and South America. Who do you think paid for it? Well, the, that's El Greco, by the way. This uh, golden era of painters uh, started coming in. Uh, there's obviously many that you know. Uh, you have El Greco, which... The Expolio, Burial of Count Orgas, uh, View of Tol- all these like great painters, Luis de Morales, uh, Juan Sanchez Catan, uh, Rivalta. Uh, Velasquez comes a little later, uh, but still, I guess we can put it technically in that same group, I guess. Um, and Here, there's uh, El Escorio. El Escorio. Yeah, it's incredible, man. And it's huge, too. <laughs> I mean, it's. Uh, and it was built there in the uh, at the foothills of a Sierra in Spain because think like how, how they see things, uh, the, how they plan. Uh, the, the summer apparently in Spain, in central Spain, gets pretty hot, like Texas, I guess. And they realize, you know what? We need a place to go there in the hot of summer, you know. So we'll go there, and they built it there. So it's a cool weather, nice, uh, which is only like thirty miles away from Madrid, for I what I understand. Um, and they uh, expand the faith in literary work. And then you have Gongora or Gongora. Sometimes I got to anglicize, so I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, uh, Tirso de Molina, Agustin Moreno, uh, Montalban, Alarcón, De Castro, Amesqua, you know, so many, many. One of the key things, by the way, literally speaking, because a, a lot of people forget about this fact, is there is this guy 
who uh, we owe a lot in the Spanish speaking world um, because he was the one who basically codified um, uh, the, the Spanish language, you know, and it was in the 1400s. Actually, I have the quote. Let me find it because uh, it was an interesting quote when they put it together. You know, they got to codify it. It's the uh, grammar of the Spanish language by Nebrija. And now let me, uh, he presents the Spanish language codified uh, and presents it to Queen Isabella. And Queen Isabella says, what is this? And he's like, he responds to this, and I quote, After your highness have subjugated barbarous peoples and nations of varied tongues, with conquest will come the need for them to accept the loss that the conqueror imposes on the conquered, and among them our language. With this work, that grammatical work of mine, they will be able to learn it as we now learn Latin from the Latin grammar. And that's a reflection of the Spanish thought already. It's like, okay, we're going to conquer these things, but we cannot just disenfranchise this group of people. We cannot send them to reservations or concentration camps or whatever it is. You know, We have to incorporate them. And in order for us to incorporate them, we have to create a bridge or a, a medium, a channel for them to become Spaniards and not necessarily just, you know, be subjects of the lower classes. That was the purpose of the Spanish grammar, which, by, by the way, was the first of its kind in all Europe. You know, it was before any, before English or German or Dutch, whatever it is, that they have a grammar. Um, that comes from, again, from, from this harmony of thinking. Um, anyway. Excellent. So... Tell us about what happens in the Netherlands. Oh, my friends, the Dutch, which, I, by the way, shout out to them. And I want to, before I continue, and I forget, I want to dedicate this uh, show, this privilege to my friends uh, in Spain, Argentina, Mexico, and the United States. And I'll tell you quickly the reasons why. Spain is under attack, religious attack. Argentina, just uh, the government imposed abortion. Mexico is suffering vandalism to churches. In the United States, well, I don't have to specify. We're going through a lot. Um, so my prayers and please, all of y'all, pray for those countries specifically. I will definitely appreciate it. Um, anyway, shall we uh, continue with, with the Dutch? What happens is Calvinism enters the lower countries and it creates a separation. And the Dutch really start thinking, you know what? We like Charles I because he was born here. He was one of us. Yeah, he reigned in Spain and he died in Spain. And, you know, he really embraced Hispanic culture and all that. But he was one of ours. Philip II was born in Spain. And they're like, no, nah, we're going to use that as a pretext. The setting is Belgium, for example, was they were already trading colonies. So when the uh, expulsion of the Jews happened earlier, you know, decades earlier, a lot of them ended up in the lower countries and in England, and a lot of them were merchants. So they was kind of a natural fit. So they were there. And when Calvinism entered the lower countries, it was just the perfect storm to create divisions because now they were starting to see themselves as a different kind of people, no longer Spaniards uh, or no longer Hispanic, to be more specific. Um, and they started um, embracing piracy, believe it or not. And they started attacking Portugal. This brings me to a quick parenthesis. Portugal, under Philip II, became united with Spain under this dynastic union. I know the Tordesillas Treaty, that deserves a whole show on its own and all that, but for the longest time they were separated, there was a problem with succession, King Sebastian and all that. Long story short is, under King Philip, he becomes the king of both Portugal and Spain. Well, the uh, Dutch were like, we're going to attack Portugal's possessions. And that was seen as an attack on Spain because now Spain is in charge of Portugal. So the Spanish have to go and defend the Portuguese. And they realized the English, they're starting financing movements and this Calvinist of insurrection, kind of like guerrilla tactics. So we're going to create guerrilla that's going to be expensive because you cannot necessarily, you know, squash guerrilla movements that easily anyway. You know, it's not the same. So uh, that takes a lot of money. This is one of the ironies, is a lot of the money that was coming from the New World 
ended up imprinting presses in the lower countries specifically. You know, and that actually didn't sit very well with people in Castilla because Castilla was losing business, but King uh, Charles I and even King Philip were trying to give privileges to the people in the lower countries so they won't feel disenfranchised. Well, that was apparently not enough after uh, so long time and, and really Calvinism really put a, put a wedge between those two societies. It broke the alliances. What uh, started as brotherhood under the same family became like strangers at the end of the 80 years war. That conflict, by the way, those separations and the Protestant revolt and all these things eventually fed into the 80 years war, which is a series of conflicts between Protestant lower countries and Catholic uh, monarch Spain. Right. So the uh, Dutch revolt begins to, I believe the, the first widespread mob violence, I believe is in the 1560s, right? When Trent is closing down around 1565. Mm -hmm. Philippines are also being discovered at the same time. We'll cover that on another show. But the, so the Calvinists are making common cause with Jews or whoever else wants to, or I, I believe William uh, William of Orange, Orange was kind of just a, an opportunist. Like he was Catholic or Protestant, whatever he wanted to do, but depending on which which would give him the most benefit. Um, so basically a bunch of elites, um, Jews, whoever else wants to make common cause, they're using propaganda mm -hmm. to whip up a mob and the mobs start to destroy churches. And that's when Philip II is trying to clamp down. Yeah. And that map, if you notice or appreciate, actually is missing the northern part of Italy. Like Milan uh, was part of the Spanish Dominion. And there was a little trail that you will go from Italy, northern Italy, all the way there to the lower countries named the Spanish Trail or the Camino Español. Because they, they dominated and they had this uh, company called the Tercios, the Thirds, I guess, in English. And they were the most famous. Uh, fearless uh, elite force. Think of it that way. Uh, quick parenthesis. So Philip was using that. Why do I say that? That's relevant because the Tercios, uh, warfare, uh, many of you know this, was seen as uh, for the elites, like the novelty, you know, because yeah, it was an expensive endeavor. Well, Spain changed that. Spain was, again, uh, harmonizing things. And, and he, Spain said, well, I got to be able to make every citizen a potential soldier. And then this guy, you know, had this awesome idea um, that published a book. He went to Italy, what's well, now the Italy, and study uh, uh, fencing. That's the word I was looking for, you know, that whole swords and all that. Um, his name was uh, Geronimo Carranza, Geronimo Carranza, Carranza. And uh, pioneer something what is called uh, destreza or dexterity, you know, um, and it's basically how to properly use the sword. And he spread it and a lot of people learn it. This guy, his pupil named Luis Pacheco perfected. But anyway, and the tercios knew how to handle the sword. And that gave him a tactical advantage because really, honestly, Swiss guards were a lot better. They're stronger, taller, faster, you name it. Now, Northern Europeans, physically speaking, they're more gifted, you know, to put it that way. How is it that this guy who is actually more gifted loses against this Spanish guy, who is not a small thing either, but, you know, you get the point. Um, it is because these guys were better trained. Uh, and it was because the school of dexterity, you know, in other words. But it was not just a force who was going there and, you know, kicking rear ends left and right. Actually, the, the concept of being a tercio was kind of like a chivalry concept. You know, there was an honor to the Catholic faith. So they traveled with this whole posse with family members and people. And so it was an enterprise traveling every time they went up there. So they they built bridges whenever they had to cross a river, whatever it is, going to quell a rebellion. You know, they left the infrastructure behind. Um, so they were hoping that even with the tercios, which were very honorable, very merciful and all these things, maybe things will not get out of hand. Well, obviously it didn't work because the, the purpose was not to be in peace with the king. The purpose was to break with the king. And eventually they accomplished that. Obviously they accomplished it with the help of the English, with the uh, corsarios, which is the, um, 
when they granted licenses for piracy from the crown, from the English crown, so they can raid uh, Spanish ports. Um, and eventually that really wore on, on, on the Spanish crown and the Dutch uh, ended up breaking apart and the king had to recognize their independence. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, but there we go. There we go. Um, what's interesting to me about the Dutch revolt is that it's the first act of a bunch of elites to use propaganda to whip up a mob and then creates a declaration of independence in 1581, which specifically cites the imposition of Catholicism as a grievance <laughs> against the king. Now, there could, I mean, there can be admitted some excesses because, for example, the Spanish, uh, some of the Spanish soldiers did mutiny at times because there was a lack of money paying them. So they went off and destroyed things as soldiers sometimes do, unfortunately. So that was causing, uh, there was a provocation used by the elites to whip up the mob. But they have this Declaration of Independence in 1581, which becomes sort of the seed of the Protestant-fueled anti-Catholic Republican revolutions, which happened in the next century in England, which ultimately feeds into the American Revolution eventually, which then will cause the epic confrontation between the American Empire and the Spanish Empire in the 19th century, okay. which we'll discuss in the future. But as we close, the really at, by 1600, this the Protestant advance has been checked. There, the Protestant has advanced in the in the countries. Um, really, England is lost very much because it's an island, and they there's they're cut off. Philip II tried to invade England; it failed. Um, but the Protestant advance has very much been checked, and there's even a counter advance happening by the Catholics. Um, can you tell us about some of the great saints that are coming out of Spain? during um, this time absolutely well first and foremost one of my favorite centuries of avila uh maria of Agreda. you know there's uh there's just so many uh saint john of the cross uh they're coming out of that era uh to mention just a few i mean that's the uh, those are heavyweights you know saint Teresa of avila is a doctor of the church i mean just remind you uh that's not a small thing um in that's one of the ironies when people refer to that period as especially under Spain, like, oh, it was a horrible period. You know what? They produce a lot of saints for such for being such a horrible period. I mean, I haven't seen that lately. Um, I wish <laughs> you know we can we can find that to be honest. Um, and and this is the thing, you know. Uh, and I mentioned Agrida because it has sort of direct connection with us here in Texas. That's why I couldn't escape that one, but um it is important to remember that when we think of the Enlightenment and all the damages and the French Revolution specifically, all the damages that it caused to humanity, because it was horrible. And that's undeniable. Sadly, honestly, really stems, in my estimation, from the breakup of the church. Everything went downhill once you uh, split the church, the body of Christ. You split northern and southern Europe. And though northern countries were able to gain power, it is a terrenal, ter like um, like an earthly gain. Um, it's, it's, they're treasures that rust, in other words, to, to paraphrase the Bible. Um, but at what expense? You know, yes, you're rich and powerful, but at what expense? You know, what's the cost in your soul on that? And they were able to succeed on the earthly realm but look what happened, you know, the French Revolution, the Communist Revolt, and all these things like, heck, France. I mean, this is a different topic, but Louis XIV, uh, you know, this was supposed to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart. He didn't do it. And look what happened. You know, it's like, um, and that's one of the lessons at the end. And I know we're running out of time. The reason I, we're talking about these things is not that I want people to just know about Spain. I mean, although I want that, um, I'm not trying to geek it out or you know just give you another fact. Though is just like Salamanca had a real application to the New World, Spain has a real application to our nation, particularly in America. Uh, and I said it before is we are facing similar challenges, black legends against our nation, just. You know, with his virtues and flaws, I get it. I'm not going to argue against that. But we also are facing some black legends. We're trying to find our identity. We're trying to there's just juggle a lot of things, culturally speaking. We're trying to find our soul as a nation. 
Um, and we're facing surrounding enemies. Right now we have a bunch of people who are hostile to the faith in the open. They have always been there, but now they're in the open. Well, guess what? Spain had the Turks and had the Moors and had the Protestants and had, you know, uh, all these the pirates and whatnot. Maybe, maybe we should look at uh, Spain and see how can we apply, just like Salamanca was an application into their challenges, how can we apply the Spain's lesson to our nation? And that's why I tell you those things. Yeah, I love uh, the, especially the Jesuit order. I mean, the Jesuit order comes out of Spain. You've got St. Ignatius, St. Leola, yeah. and St. Francis Xavier. Yeah. St. Francis Xavier goes all the way to China. Yeah. Um, the St. Ignatius, the whole Jesuit order is really the, the front lines of the counter revolution, mm -hmm. counter reformation, uh, winning back souls for Christ to the church, gaining new territory of souls for Christ. And it's being fueled so much by the Spanish crown. Sure. And this is something that we need to thank Spain for, for evangelizing half the world. Yeah. So much of the of so many souls were saved for Christ. Uh, we want to go to a few questions before we wrap up here. Um, here's a great question of God's providence: Why didn't God allow Catholic Spain to conquer Protestant heretical England with the Invincible Armada in 1588? Well, we know the storm, right? And King Philip said, "I send my men to fight against." Um uh soldiers not against the elements uh but that being said honestly um i don't think it was spain's role to conquer england per se it was the english role to conquer england a lot of the english seminarians went to spain to get educated and then went back to england to preach and try to evangelize most of them didn't make it because obviously you know what the english civil war did to uh you know their own people um, is one of the realms of speculation. I don't have the answer why the English went that way and Spain didn't bring them back. Um, Spain may have lost that battle, but literally gained half of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Here's a point. Uh, Jose Eduardo says the University of Salamanca made today's Gregorian calendar. Oh, yeah. Uh, I want to send, by the way, a shout out. Um, Thanks to you, Timothy. I was asking some of my uh, scholar friends questions about uh, economics and Salamanca and all that. And now I have homework. Uh, Danielle Marine, which I want to send me this thick book to read. You know, it's like homework and assignments and, and other books and whatnot. And um, so I have a lot of homework to do. And I, I guess it's thanks to you and uh, Guillermo Perez Galici as well. Uh, shout out to both of them. Excellent. Yeah, so Spain is really countering the Protestant revolt. All of these saints are coming out of Spain. And next time, God willing, in a few weeks, we'll talk more about uh, the rest of Spain that's going on. We've got South America. We've got the, Arab, the Incan Empire, the area of Pachamama. <laughs> we also have uh, the Philippines, which yeah. becomes part of the United States in the 20th century later on when there is the epic confrontation, which we will, we'll talk about the, in the next century and the, in the 1600s and in the 1700s, I see two popes in particular that stop that tragically become the sort of the betrayers of Spain and the cause of the counter reformation. That's urban, the, the eighth in the 1600s. And then Clement the 14th in the 18th century and what they do. And we're, this is helps us relate to the time period that we're dealing with, with Pope Francis is that the, the pious efforts of Catholics have been thwarted before by the Pope, unfortunately. Yeah. So we'll get into that in the uh, future episodes of Catholic empire, the true story of Spain. Any final thoughts before we close out? Luis. Um, yeah, very quickly. First of all, thank you for having me over. And also, I want to remind to all of y'all who are watching us, I know that the world looks scary right now, um, but it's nothing that our ancestors haven't faced before. And just keep in mind this. Once again, anybody, anybody can relate and learn from the Hispanic empire. You don't have to be a tan looking guy, you know, uh, like stereotypical physically looking or... 
anybody. And it's a great resource. Just don't waste it. I mean, you have it right there. Uh, and and obviously, the Spanish spirit is always a uh, spirit of uh, fighting and never give up. And that's our call as Catholics. You know, that applies to anybody. And also, very quickly, may I remind you, uh, in case you were wondering that or, you know, doubting that, well, you know, it's easy for you to say you're Spanish, the same guy. You know, you have Guadalupe, which, you know, there are only two two pieces of imprint, to put it that way, that are not of human origin. One is the Shroud of Turin. The other one is the Tilma of Our Lady Guadalupe. So it's easy for you to cling to that because it's part of your heritage. Uh, may I remind you that in the 1800s, the bishops here in the United States consecrated our nation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Immaculate Conception, I'm sorry, Immaculate Conception. And so we're part of the picture, just as the Spanish are. We have as much right just as they had. Uh, cling to that. Don't despair. And uh, like I always say, Viva Cristo Rey. Absolutely. I, I got one more question for you about Columbus. Um, why do Latinos, why do they not revere Columbus like other Catholics? Um, Columbus is a very interesting story. Uh, you got to divide it in two stages. Columbus, especially in Mexico, has been villainized thanks to this Marxist, uh, especially infiltrating in uh, universities and public thought, particularly in Mexico, which is my closest experience, is after the revolutionary per period of the 20th century with the murals that you see, you know, part of Mexico's culture and whatnot. Trotsky was part of that movement, you know, with uh, Frida and uh, Diego Rivera and all those things. Well, they're commies, essentially. Part of their strategy was to the uh, deteriorate and confuse the Mexican mindset. And they used that dial famous dialectic. But in Mexico, it was applied to the dialectic of the conflict of uh, we are Indians conquered people suffering, eternal victims. They are the conquerors. That's why is um, in Columbus all of a sudden becomes a villain. I remind a lot of people, Hernan Cortez was hailed a hero, you know, up until the independence of Mexico. I mean, he was, his uh, uh, remains were in Mexico, still are in Mexico. Um, is as the Masons came in, but particularly the communists, they changed that narrative uh, and they vilified anybody who came from Europe. Well, obviously that's silly because, you know, we're all part of it. Uh, the fact that, and I'll tell people this very quickly, we think in Spanish or European, whatever you want to call it, like you and I, we speak a European language. We think like Europeans because that's our heritage and there's nothing wrong with it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and there's nothing wrong with our Indian roots either. Uh, there's, it's perfectly fine, you know, but in this Marxist dialectic, it wants to exclude one, obviously, the Christian side. It wants to push it to the pagan one. We know what their intentions are. And that's why it's vilified. But Columbus, he was a horrible governor. He was a great explorer. <laughs> um, he, he, um, we owe a lot to Columbus. And it's a shame. You know the story of Our Lady of Pillar and you know, all the discovery of the New World and all that. Uh, and if you ask me, Timothy, and all the guys who are watching me, um, I agree. We should be reviewing Columbus even more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, d make sure to celebrate Our Lady of the Pillar October 12th every single year. Yeah. It's a great feast of the Americas. Really, really, October 12th and December 12th, tomorrow. Yeah. Two, two big feast days of the Americas. So everybody have a great feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Let's beseech the intercession of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Yeah. And we're going to offer up an Our Father here. Absolutely. For um, for the healing of our memories, especially that we can know the glory of our fathers through Spain and preaching the gospel and to give us the fortitude to face what we face today. I'm going to offer up this. Uh, this is uh, this is Diego Velasquez, uh, one of fa my favorite painters oh, yeah. of the period that we're discussing. Yeah. So this is coming out of the Baroque culture that we'll we'll discuss in future. So let's offer up in our Father for this attention. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Jadis, sanctificetum nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat vaduntas tua, sicut in cedo et in terra. Pane Nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimiti nobis debita nostra, sicut nos dimitibus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libranos a malo. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. 
Amen. Amen.